are in the hands of an adolescent. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Warp Core Podcast. I am Urza Master, with me as always is Lord Uther, and tonight we have Zur and the Kodan Armada. Uh, thank you for joining us again, Zur. We appreciate your time. Um, I- I'm not going to take too long to introduce this movie. This uh, is Star Trek IX Insurrection, the third next-gen movie. Um, I just refreshed my memory on this before the pod today and i found new appreciation for it in this probably umpteenth review so today's episode i want to kick this off with zur because i think he's got a lot to say and i'm really excited to hear your perspective so zur let's hear it thank you ursa master thank you lord uther for bringing me along on the voyage so tonight we will discuss star trek insurrection which as Ursa Master mentioned, is our third Next Generation title, the ninth overall in the Star Trek movie franchise. And what happened behind the scenes on this picture is almost as interesting, if not as interesting, as what we actually ended up getting as audience members throughout. Okay, so let's set the stage. Uh, Two years earlier, In 96, we had had Star Trek First Contact with the Borg, the first PG-13 rated Star Trek adventure. Uh, Was a hit with critics, was a hit with audiences. Everyone was very excited about what direction the franchise could go. And much like many of the James Bond pictures throughout the uh, 70s and 80s, they were on a strict time schedule. So they release a picture, get another one right into pre-production and shooting and do all of that again about every two years or so and that's been the the cycle since we started with generations 94 96 so this would be the 1998 iteration Uh, we've jumped back to pg a a family-friendly rating this will be the last time any star trek big screen feature gets the pg rating so uh, and when you watch the picture, I mean, it is, it is fairly bloodless. Uh, that is to say, the, the violence is, is nothing you wouldn't feel bad taking an eight-year-old to see, uh, so on. So we, we dipped back into that, and then for the next picture, we'll, we'll cross the PG-13 line for good uh, with our Trek. This was also the latest Star Trek movie that was ever released on the calendar. It opened on December 11th. 1998 uh, and it was the third film released in December Uh, since the disappointing results of the final frontier they had said we're gonna stay out of the the crowded summer movie season and do all of our pictures in the last part of the year so first two next-gen films were right around Thanksgiving and then this one was basically two weeks before Christmas 1998 Uh, and, and in terms of overall box office, it flew right within where Paramount Pictures Studios wanted it to, to you know, land for Star Trek fans. It, the fans went. There was not a lot of crossover from non-fans, the things that boosted First Contact or, say, Star Trek for the Voyage Home. So uh, the, the converted, the choir was singing, but... It wasn't drawing in necessarily ticket uh, people from the, you know, outside of that uh, constituency. So uh, it also had a very large budget. It was about $70 million uh, for this one. Uh, so now, now to the fun part. Uh, initially, uh, producer Rick Berman, who had overseen the, all the franchises on television, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Next Gen, he wanted to do something really, really dark uh, and, and literally wanted to do Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness with the Star Trek uh, setting. Really? Indeed. Wow. He wanted to do a, basically Apocalypse Now with Star Trek. 
That was his initial pitch to the studio shortly after oh, first contact. Man, that'd have been good. And you can see, you can see in this picture the genesis of that, pun intended. Uh, and then we'll get into really quickly later how the studio did. Basically, here was his pitch. Uh, he wanted a beloved cast member, in this case, uh, Lieutenant Commander Data, uh, to basically go rogue and for the Enterprise crew to have uh -huh. to metaphorically and literally go upriver using Data as sort of the Colonel Kurtz, if you will, to go in and uh, terminate him with extreme prejudice if, because he has taken uh, Starfleet personnel uh, hostage. And so the picture was supposed to be Picard and the crew journeying on this alien planet to find Data and shut him down. And the, the overarching arc of the Baku and the Sona, which we'll get into as we're describing the picture, that those elements were all still right. in there. The plan was to catch up with Data, for him to reveal the duplicity of Starfleet and the uh, Sona, uh, and then to have Picard and the crew trying to race back to warn the Federation of what was going on, and of course, you know, trying to be opposed there. And Data would have died, been, quote, sacrificed, slash whatever. Uh, and this is what actor Brett Spiner wanted. He, at this point, at the franchise, he thought he was too old to play the role and wanted out. So what they had was Hello, this incredibly dark, incredibly dark, you know, PG-13 bordering on the R, I suppose, idea of et cetera, with this big heroic, you know, thing for Data at the end. Oh, I, I didn't go bad at all. I was trying to save the Federation kind of a... So he turned that in and Paramount said, Paramount Pictures at the time, the administration, they said, they said, no, they said, we like the Whales movie. And he goes, why can't we do one of those? Why can't we make it lighter? Ugh. We think audiences will enjoy. So the entire Heart of Darkness metaphor and, and storyline was basically condensed into the first act uh, uh, and, and, quickly, yeah. and quickly disposed of, if you will, so that they could get to the rest of the story. Uh, and Berman, I mean, that's that's, you know, the guys at Paramount are writing the checks. So, I mean, ultimately, you know, they, they won out, but that was the initial impetus. And I'm not saying that's going to be a better movie. It would have been a wildly different movie. Uh, and it could, have, oh, yeah. it could, it could have had the much. impact. It could have had some of that emotional impact. Like that could have transcended what ultimately became. And I think we, we touched on this last week what many fans regard this film as a sort of an extended television episode, right? Or the idea being that, that yeah. it feels, it feels in the box for what, what they were able to accomplish on the television show. But, you know, again, we've got a bigger budget and some cooler effects and so forth. Now, my thesis is that I don't necessarily see that as a negative, you know, an extended TV episode, because what, what this film of the four Next Generation films does is it really gives us these sort of breakaway, takeaway character moments with the crew. Yep. You know, starting with the uh, the first time we see the Enterprise E, uh, they're hosting you know uh, a diplomatic mission on board, and they're in their you know their finest Starfleet dress, you know, et cetera. And the whole sequence is, takes about you know almost eight to 10 minutes of screen time. And just starting there, you can you can see they're very relaxed with each other. They're playful, uh, they're, they're human. They're not just stick figures, you know, that were, oh, there's the captain, there's the counselor, there's Lieutenant Worf. Although also at this time, you might, you might see how hard they're trying to shoehorn all this in. It, it, at this point, Captain Picard just kind of, Worf, what the hell are you doing here? Like, you know, you're, you're, right, supposed, exactly. to, you're supposed to be on that TV yeah. show. What's going on here? And, and Worf, like, <laughs> half, you know, throws an answer. Oh, I was in a conference, and I just wanted to stop by and see everybody. Um, and there are several references throughout to the, the Federation negotiating with the Dominion and they, you know, they reference all of the unrest that's been chronicled in the in the television shows at this time. Watching it now, almost 30 years later, you're, you're divorced from all of that. 
but at the time you're watching, oh, this is great. They were just, I just saw that on Voyager last week, and now. So, so but you can. You so can I got to ask the question. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, go ahead. Why didn't they make a Why didn't they make a Dominion movie? I mean, why? I mean, the Enterprise E. It's the flagship of the Federation. Why isn't it out there fighting the Dominion? I I never understood that. Part. Even though I love this film, don't get me wrong, and I hadn't seen all of DS Nine to completely understand a Dominion piece. But Jean Luc Picard not going against the Dominion. Help no, me out I mean here, sir. No, and I mean, you know, it, it's the same fan frustration you might get in the in the Marvel pictures. Like, why are all these Marvel heroes suddenly isolated and can't call in Thor and the Hulk to help solve their problems? It's all, I mean, it's, you know, comic books do that all the time. Like, well, it'd just be easy if we could just summon Superman, then he could, you know, but unfortunately, yeah. uh, that's, I mean, that's, that we just have to buy that as, as fans of, of this type of thing. I think the answer also lies in who they hired to write this. Now, the first two Next Gen films were co-written by Brown and Braga and Ronald D. Moore. Uh, and they, this would, First Contact was their last Star Trek big screen feature. Uh, for this one, they turned to Michael Piller, uh, who was a television writer beginning in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. He worked on uh, Cagney and Lacey. He worked on The Dukes of Hazard. Uh, he worked on Simon and Simon. And these were all you can you can Google those if you're not familiar with those youngins. Uh, but those were all television shows on network TV back in the. And what happened was, uh, and you you two might be able to speak to a little more of this because again with my Next Generation I, I was late to the party, but the first two seasons of Next Generation uh, were marked by uh, writers coming and going and producers quitting and getting rehired and then quitting again. There was a little bit of unrest early on. And the show seemingly found more of a, of a spine slash stable foundation beginning with season three, which is when Michael Piller was invited to be the showrunner. Rick Berman would be the producer, Michael Piller would be the showrunner, and he contributed he only contributed like personal writing on the show from seasons three to its final season seven. He only did about 13 episodes, but some of the ones he, he contributed to, uh, he did both episodes of the best of both worlds. He did unification one and two. He did one that's very popular, I think called times arrow. I mean, I know he wrote times arrow. I'm not I'm oh, yeah. overstate. It's times arrow is amazing. It's I don't want to overstate its popularity, but anyways, so he was, he was enough in the DNA of the show to stabilize it and make it a fan favorite that when Paramount came to Rick Berman and said, we want you to do another Star Trek show. That was DS9. Michael Piller wrote the pilot, Emissary, uh, and would be the uh, showrunner for that show for the first two seasons. And then when they said, we want you to do another Star Trek show, well, that became Voyager. Once again, he was the co-showrunner first two seasons. So Michael Piller is a guy who knows wow. Star Trek, again, inside and out. But as, as we've said, he's never written a feature, right? He's never written a big screen movie. So when they approached him to do this, his mind was, I'm going to write a great Star Trek story, but it, it has all the architectural and structural hallmarks of television, because that's just the voice that he yeah. was comfortable expressing. So, uh, so anyways, so to so that's that's how we got Michael Piller, and he wanted he he agreed with the studio that to, to go lighter. You know, like I say, Rick Berman, he he got his heart of darkness, but in Act One, and it was Piller who who brought in many of the moments we'll probably cite later in this podcast as some of our favorites, because you're talking about the interactions and the human element of the crew. Uh, versus, you know, just more like, let's do the plot and let's, you know, have this gargantuan thing. Um, the conflict itself, the overarching conflict between a race of people that has separated and you've got the, the elders who went one way and the young rebellious punks who went another, that feels to me, having not seen every episode of Star Trek, though, that feels like something that is a classic Star Trek setup, going back to the original series, the next gen, I mean, you know, how many times have you seen a civilization tearing itself apart and now the Enterprise finds itself <laughs> in the middle? I mean, and again, I, I don't I don't mind that. 
I, I think that allows them to reach down and reach for philosophical or moral questions that might get lost chasing Khan or something of that nature where it's not about the, the visceral action adventure, that, but we actually have to stop for a second and say, hey, wait a minute, let me consider that for a different point of view. I also think that this goes against one of Gene Roddenberry's hopes for the franchise, which is to say he wanted a more peaceful, you know, unified Federation Starfleet, if you will, the voice of peace, and we yeah. move past, you know, our petty grievances and, and human flaws of the of the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, this film, to my knowledge, is probably the most overt to have. I mean, we can go back to Undiscovered Country to a degree. That was a, a conspiracy involving there, but here, I mean, that first shot. That first sequence uh, on uh, the planet, uh, it, it stuns you because you have these clearly villainous looking alien creatures. We haven't met them yet, the, the Sona, but they don't look like good guys. And they're working shoulder to shoulder with Starfleet personnel on something that we don't understand yet what it is that they're, they're spying on this tranquilic bucolic village. You know, so they're seemingly up to no right. good, but Starfleet is like, you know, abetting and aiding this. Why is that, right? I mean, as a as a Star Trek, you know, what's going on here? And then we get all of a sudden, you know, uh, Data, uh, who we quickly surmise cannot be seen by the village, going going rogue and uh, fighting off these these uh, infiltrators, watchers, and and uh, you know, firing a phaser and, and revealing their presence and. Nobody seems to be very happy about it, the village or the people doing the watching. It's a great opening. I mean, it truly is. I mean, it puts you, because you have so many questions. Again, the, the single biggest one is, why is Starfleet helping these guys? So I, I throw it over to you guys for a minute just to, yeah. just to talk about how, how this thing kind of launches in. Urza, I always default to you, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that hits the nail on the head. It, it's just... Yes, it feels like the opening of a TV episode. There's some immediate crisis that's revealed to us with a million questions. Uh, and and it's, it's interesting because you think of this on the big screen, but you feel like you're in your living room. You know, you, you really feel like you're watching this on the Thursday night or wherever, whatever night Star Trek was on back in the day, I don't even remember. Um, you know, you, you, you really feel like you're getting pulled into an episode. I, I half expected you know, like, Q to show up at some point, because, like, how does Data lose his mind? Is Q fucking... You know, and that's the thing <laughs> about the later next-gen movies, is, like, where's Q? It becomes the question, I think, in this movie, and, and it's like the Marvel thing, where's Thor? You know, why aren't they just calling up their buddies and be like, hey, Sandman's terrorizing the city, I need your help, uh, Hulk, or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I always thought it was interesting just the, the effects that they used. Uh, like when Data's head is suddenly, like, appearing in front of people and these kids are getting freaked out. Like, it just feels kind of, like, action-y but sort of goofy. And I think it speaks to that PG rating. Is like, as much as it's, a you know, like a firefight, it's also sort of just bizarre. Um, and it's interesting. I love that Heart of Darkness idea. I think it could have made a really great dark movie oh yeah at, which would have played right into the hands of ds9 um because if you know the dominion war which when we get to ds9 i'm sure we'll talk a lot about it that that whole show that when it became what it was at the end really was a very dark star trek series uh, i mean it had a lot of light-hearted moments but you know the whole dominion war really challenges the foundations of what the federation is and reveals a lot about it uh and this is if you view it from that lens of, you know, being a DS9 fan, like, it fits. It fits almost perfectly. And I think, you know, I never had a problem with why the Enterprise wasn't in DS9 fighting alongside them for the Dominion War, because there's still a lot of other parts of the galaxy that they have to be involved in. And the Enterprise being the flagship is kind of going to have to lead the charge of all of the other interests of the Federation especially with the most tenured crew, 
somebody who's negotiated peace with not just the Klingons, but the Romulans, you know, and Picard naturally being like out there signing treaties and making alliances, strengthening the Federation. You know, I, I would assume that Picard probably at one point met with the Breen and got kicked out. You know, I've always wanted to see that. Where's the Breen movie? You know, um, so this this opening again coming from a, a Deep Space Nine fan perspective. I love the next generation. I jumped to Deep Space Nine. I didn't watch as much Voyager as I should have, but you know, I'm I'm thinking of this movie as sort of being a companion episode. But they're bringing that next gen crew that you were waiting to see on Deep Space Nine. I mean, you had Miles O'Brien, you had Worf, and I think it's really interesting because there's a trill on the Enterprise. Um, I think they're called trills. Now I'm starting to second guess myself. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. But, you know, I'm thinking, okay, all these connections are forming. Yeah, I mean, it's just, exactly. So it's like, you know, I, I, I think of it as, as the long extended episode that I think fans wanted who were watching Deep Space Nine who missed the next generation. And honestly, I think that's why the approach, this opening sequence actually works really well. I... Yes, it's a long episode, in my opinion. From the from the first time you see them all together, minus Data, right, on the Enterprise, first of all, the lighting's completely different, in my opinion. It's that bright light that you're used to in an episode that we didn't see the past two movies, and, and I commented on the darkness before, so, right, there's a lot of light there. I don't think those actors felt so good or so themselves as they did in that opening shot, like it almost felt like it was a reunion in a sense. And they, it's kind of like I told Aaron or sorry, Zur what the other day, it's like, you know what? We, we don't talk for a while and we just pick up from right, where, right where we left off. Like there's no gap, nothing like that. Right. No, no continuity missed at all. And I felt like when I saw the crew all together, like kind of messing around a little bit. And then, you know, Troy's like telling him, telling Picard how to say that, Shajin Jufar or whatever it was and he's trying to practice it. It, it and then of course he goes in he meets them and they put that thing on his head and he's got to be very like those beads and he has to be very careful it was just it felt even though I like the other two movies it just felt good it just felt again like hmm I'm going to watch one of my favorite episodes of, of Next Gen um, and I, I did like the whole thing with, you know, what happened to Data. I thought it was his emotion chip or something at first, uh, which obviously it wasn't. But, yeah, so that's kind of my, my feeling on, uh, on on that opening and just kind of feeling like it's next gen again. And that was another weird retcon that they did with the emotion chip. He didn't take it with him. Well, wait a minute. I thought he couldn't take it out anymore. I thought it was, like, burned into his. Oh, yeah. Bag. So they just kind of, you know, conveniently rewrote that part. Um, which, I mean, for me, I don't care. And I think it gets back to that Star Trek, Star Wars thing is like some things just don't need to be explained and you just accept it. Uh, and for me, it's just like, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm good with it. You know, kind of the whole premise of what's going on on this planet and this quote unquote briar patch that it's located in, in space is yeah. kind of like, okay, I got gotcha. <laughs> you. Yeah. Well, that brings us to it, like the main... Oh, go ahead. That brings us to sort of the main conflict that we get here, uh, which is they arrive and, you know, right away things aren't adding up, right? The, they were told that these were hostages being held against their will, and yet the, the Baku villagers are, you know, plying them with, you know, the best snacks and, and locations since Rivendell. Uh, and we have... <laughs> We yeah. have a bunch of uh, we have a bunch of uh, name actors or people who are known to the universe at large. Again, uh, Donna Murphy, who plays uh, Ange or Anij, or I'm not I forgot how exactly. Oh yeah, uh, Anij. So she yeah. had she was not necessarily known to young fanboys and film audiences, but she had just won the Tony Award uh, twice, uh, almost in back to back oh. seasons. So she was a Broadway established force, including for a revival of The King and I, where she played Anna. So she was, you know, uh, kind of a big deal, kind of a big get for that role. 
Uh, F. Murray Abraham, who of course is an Oscar winner for Amadeus uh, for his role as Solari. Oh, so and good. It's so funny with his career because in the last, I'd say, decade, he's really had sort of a renaissance. Yeah. Uh, with with he did a terrific job in Homeland with uh, Claire Danes and Mandy Patinkin. He was a he was a yeah, shadowy he was a shadowy operative type, and he, he underplayed it tremendously. Uh, tremendously, he was the best thing in the Coen Brothers Inside Llewellyn Davis. A picture I was not happy with, but but F. Murray Abraham, like he's on screen for five minutes and, and steals the picture. Uh, and then recently he was on HBO's The White Lotus. So his actual he's actually had a really good run the last few years. But this was a time in his career when he was doing like I'm hunting iced tea in the in the forest, you know, surviving the game type stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, exactly. So what an he, awful he, premise, Jesus. Right? He would work for a ham sandwich, you know, kind of a thing. But <laughs> his credit. Unless we forget a couple years out, he's in The Mummy, which right. he did really I mean, good. So. I was yes. waiting for him to scream in this movie, not to read from a book, but never happened. <laughs> he's in The Mummy? But, but, but to his credit here, for the most part, I mean, maybe at the end we start to get a little bit of the mustache twirling and the, the primal screaming that they used in the trailer so well, but did not play as well in the actual uh, picture. Uh, but for the most part, he, he gives a certain menace and a certain gravitas. His his uh, Sona partner in crime, Greg Henry, who's also, if you look up his credits, he's uh, he's done a few things. Uh, it's Greg, G-R-E-G-G, -G, Henry. Anyways, uh, he was quite yeah. good as well. I, this is a, a well-acted picture. Oh, and we also had uh, uh, McCormick from Hardcastle and McCormick, another television show. He was uh, Daniel... Uh, Hugh Kelly was in there briefly. He was uh, this, our team. This guy our was team. in Scarface. Uh, F. Murray Abraham? Or no, no. The, oh, he was, and so is this this Greg Henry guy. Right. No, he exactly. was in Scarface as well. Scarface alumni. All right, sorry. Didn't they're mean to break your... They're, they're heading to the Scarface Federation. Alumni. <laughs> so, we have, so we have this we have this thing where everything's not quite... The, the Admiral, Anthony Zerby, he's a little... Like he's like, okay, Jean Luc, that's great. Now get out of the briar patch, and you know, don't don't worry, we'll take care of the rest of this. Wink, right. wink. And you. you've got right. Lord, and you've got the villagers who so forth. Like I said, it's bucolic and peaceful, and look, and it all feels a bit kind of pat and a kind of you know, you know, we're kind of like, all right, so what's going on here? And this is where, like I was saying in the beginning, this is where these character moments start to come in, and. Mm -hmm. I think they, they hit me more even now as, I, as I'm older than they probably did when I was, you know, in my mid to late 20s. You know, this, the, and the, we might end up mentioning these or repeating mentioning these. I won't go into too much detail right now. But just that each member of the crew undergoes their own regeneration, reinvigoration, uh, new, new chapters opening for them potentially, paths that they may want to walk down or, you know, be tempted to walk down because of this planet's unique, you know, phasic radiation that basically is, you know, the fountain of youth. And that was Michael Piller's big pitch to Paramount when they asked him to write it. Well, what do you want to do? Well, what if they found the fountain of youth? Love it. You know, go do that. Um, <laughs> in, in, some ways, <laughs> in some ways, it's kind of, I mean, I think this is a better executed version of that type of a story than Star Trek V's was let's go find God at the center of at the edge of the universe. I think these films I agree. Have, oh I agree with that hundred percent. Oh I think these Definitely. films have a, a loose DNA connection. The idea of the crew sort of embracing immortality or you know even something with, with religious overtones or spiritual overtones. And I think this this film handles those questions and that concept much more uh, uh, with confidence and, and, and a good voice of reason than I think some of the other stumbles. And I'll, I'll leave that to you guys to, to see if you see what I saw. I mean, they're not the same picture, but in the same way when I'm watching it, I almost can feel like, yeah, Final Frontier had done some of these steps. Maybe you're talking about a different experience. I'm going to let you go, Urza, because I always default to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. 
and I honestly I hadn't thought of it. the Fountain of Youth thing. I, I always kind of get and there's a supernatural element um, to it that I think Star Trek always kind of flirts with. Um, you know, they beat you over the head with it when they meet the uh, the god entity, um, which again, where was Q in Star Trek Five? They should have been there. One of the Q. <laughs> Maybe continue. he was a Q. Uh, well, no, I believe he's an entity created by the Q, if I recall correctly. Uh-huh. Um, but regardless. I think I think in this film the interesting thing is that it's this anomaly that has some scientific basis, but also grants some kind of supernatural, you know, transcendent kind of power with like a time stoppage or a time slowing down because you have the moment with Picard and Anish, and um, and then that's how he saves her later on in the movie from the rock fall, and you know I always thought that some of the best scientific movies or you know, loosely affiliated scientific movies have that sort of underlying supernatural element. Like they're, they're not trying to completely skirt around the idea of belief or faith. Um, they're just kind of adapting it to their own purposes. So like I draw a parallel and I'm about to be a pariah. So buckle up for this ride. But I think of the Star Trek movies a lot like Indiana Jones. I look at them as they're scientific, they're archaeological in a way, they're telling stories that all kind of build towards these supernatural elements. The Ark of the Covenant, the Power of Kalima, the the Last Crusade and the uh, uh, Holy Holy Grail. Grail. And then it makes perfect sense that the next logical step is the Crystal Skull and Aliens. And everybody got mad about that, but I could see that coming a mile away. It made perfect sense, and it actually, I think, my opinion is, minus Shia LaBeouf, is a pretty damn good movie. Um, And this is kind of the same thing, is that, you know, they're artificially de-aging. You know, Riker's laying the pipe again, as we all want to see him do. Yes, Gary. Um, Picard's, like, on the cusp of laying the pipe the whole movie. That's the one thing, is the blue balls... The blue balls of this movie really bother me, um, but it, it, it's true. They're they're flirting with this idea of a power beyond understanding and comprehension. It took them hundreds of years to realize. It doesn't take hundreds of years to learn, and that's that that faith, that belief, that spirituality that can come with a perspective beyond time, which I think is a very cool concept to play with for a Star Trek movie, um, like playing with aliens an archaeological movie so uh suck on that indiana jones and the crystal skull haters (laughs) but it's i i thought it was very cool and it's something that you would see in an episode whether it's a two-parter or um you know whatever if you combine those two parters you get roughly a feature film yeah uh, or a shorter feature film anyway um it would almost have to be a three-parter with commercials i guess in the 90s but you know, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I love that they flirted with something that Star Trek often shies away from. They kind of just stick to the the formula, right? The, uh, okay, we have a new type of radiation, which we'll talk about in the next episode. Or we've got, you know, some oh, sort of God. theoretical force of nature. Here it is. It's black tar, and it's going to kill Tashi Yar, thank God. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those things, like, I love that about this movie, I love it about Trek, and it, it, what they did with the writing in this movie is they stayed very true to that Star Trek formula, um, and that was really cool to see, because I think they were reaching for something a little more artistic in the last two films, a little more dour, a little more Shakespearean, which was also awesome, and I do like those movies better, but this was a nice, again... We've been disconnected from this crew. We're watching DS9. Here's what they're doing. Love it. I don't know how I follow that. Um, I noticed a couple times in this in, in, in this movie, they actually don't explain the science part of it. Like when Doherty's like, oh, I, in this gruff old man voice, he's like, I don't know, collect some particles, and then everyone's like, young. Wait a minute. <laughs> You yes, should be. Just ex- says, like, I don't, you like I don't that? Do science. I, I just work here, right? Just... But, but, basically, I don't know any of this, but I'll be young one day. I mean, it was like that was what? Get Jordy up here and explain it to me. Gosh damn it! I, I, this is unacceptable. This is like a 
Phantom Menace movie part. Ah, uh, here we go. And, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, God, because I got, I got to say it. I, I'm going to say it now because I brought it up unintentionally. You're going to tell me, all of you out there, you're going to tell me that they can find this little kid. I hope you're looking me right, right in the eyes right now because this is how upset I am. So you're going to tell me that they can find this kid that can a- act with Brent Spiner, but you get this kid for Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Now this is pod racing. You, oh, God. Yeah, I, mean, I hated that kid so much. The, uh, but, but, but. I do like that movie. I'll, I'll uh, defend Jake uh, Lloyd on, the, on that episode. But, but that's uh-huh. All right. It's funny that uh, oh, first of you mentioned right. the short, the short, uh, this is the shortest Trek film. By the way, it, it beats oh. Search for Spock by two minutes. This was only an hour. 103 minutes was the, the running time on it. So very trim, uh, like we talked about uh, with First Contact. Not much fat on there. Uh, Not like us. Anyway, um, the other thing. <laughs> hello. I'm on fire tonight. We, we, we also kind of see. We, we, we've talked before about Picard being data's daddy in a sense like that relationship and now we see that kind of happen it's almost like the little kid was eh. i felt like data was trying to almost be fatherly or brotherly to that kid a little more fatherly maybe and that but the kid again you know in the long run the kid winds up teaching him how to be a kid because that's what data was kind of interested in um so i i thought that was kind of a neat little spin there to actually let him almost mentor someone the way Picard had mentored him. Um, I loved Worf in this film. Like, yeah. I mean, he was good in First Contact, but, you know, definitely feeling aggressive tendencies when he hits one of those things out of the ballpark. But I felt like he was kind of tough again. Um, I did like seeing that, you know, when he had the thing on the side of his nose. And, and you get the whisper between, yeah, yeah, between Data and Picard. And... And again, I love Brent Spiner's acting. For some reason in the movies, I appreciate it so much more. He is a wide-ranged, I mean, like, emotional actor in a sense. I mean, because for all those years, he was playing a Vulcan, right? Then he gets in the movies, and all of a sudden, he can kind of transition away from that and and start showing that emotion. I feel like he, again, shows off his acting chops even more. So I know I just kind of leapt ahead on a few things, Um and he has no, a lovely singing no voice. Rules here. He has a lovely singing voice. What is that? By, yes. Uh, a British tar. Uh, now, <laughs> I think when I first saw that m- moment in theaters in, in my 20s, I thought, well, here they're trying to do Voyage Home. We're going to shoehorn in some bit of business, bit of funny business. Let's have Picard and Data in a moment of high tension singing Gilbert and Sullivan. Like, so I, I think I kind of rolled my eyes upon first viewing. It, it's it's warmed me since then uh, because some of the camera angles used with particularly cutting back and forth to data singing, I think, uh, made me chuckle this time around. We had the same cinematographer for this film that we did for First Contact, Matthew Leonetti, and uh, he knew where to put the camera to get some of Brett Spiner's, like you say, the whisper for Picard there with uh, Worf's uh, acne, Klingon acne. And when he's cupping Riker's uh, bare as an, or smooth as an android's bottom chin, uh, and then he just kind of, no, no, not really. And yeah. then you see Jonathan Frake <laughs> giving a little smug, like grin, like, okay. So, and, and which leads us real quick to the, to the, this question, do we like Riker with facial hair? Uh, I saw him in the previews of Picard with a gray beard now. Or do we like him as smooth as an android's bottom uh, in this picture? You too. That's a great question. Great question. Um, I'll take that. I really enjoyed Riker beardless in the first couple seasons of the show because I felt like the first couple seasons really meandered um, and felt a lot like the original series where there were very disjointed episodes. There was not a, a lot of big arcs being told. Um, so for me, it was kind of just a nostalgia flash in the pan. Um, I loved, 
I loved the bathtub scene where he's yeah. getting shaved and then gets interrupted. Like, again, with the blue balls in this movie. <laughs> um, my God. Uh, but it was great. I, I, I think I, there's so much of them in a PG movie flirting with, like, adult humor or just adult topics, which I have, like, a, an extremely sensitive radar for because I'm like, oh, cool. Let's just talk about these funny moments because we keep we keep hinting at them. Yeah. And let's be let's be real. We don't need to explain the story. The story's pretty straightforward. All right. <laughs> the jokes the jokes in this movie are just intensely funny, uh, and my favorite is between when when Troy and Crusher are there. And yes. It's a conversation. Do you feel like your boobs have gotten firmer? <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> Data's gonna pull a Data, right? He goes over to Worf, and he wants to work this in the conversation. <laughs> and it's just, it doesn't fully happen, but man, I mean, just the clever interactions that they bring that are definitely series episode like that I think being that far disconnected from you know all good things it just feels so it feels like coming home and i i say that with purpose because as an audience member it does feel like coming home but it's a parallel it's a mirror and star trek is great at mirrors to the actual coming home of the sonos and you don't know that until very late in the movie that that's what's going on, the whole blood feud. And by by the time you find that out, you've already felt like you're back at home in a Star Trek Next Generation episode. And I don't know if it's just time and, and distance from when I first saw this movie or having finally watched one episode one through the full series of DS9 um, and then episode one through the full series of Next Generation... I have this perspective now of, holy shit, they did this perhaps unintentionally, but it really works for me. And it it, it brings me new appreciation in this movie that I didn't have before. Because to be honest, I think I've watched this, this might be my third or fourth time. Like, I, I saw it originally, I didn't care for it. The second time I watched it, I was like, oh, you know, it's all right. And then I watched it after watching Nemesis, or gearing up to watch Nemesis. And I think I liked it a little more. But this time around, I have such a deeper appreciation for what they're doing with some of these little, oh, you know, they're known for producing Catcher Cell White. Oh, wow, okay. Like, this is how they're tying this into the greater, you know, canon. And to me, that's where I think some of these little jokes, these little inside moments, which seem kind of goofy and out of place, because the story is not exactly like a funny one. They're in danger. But like on the TV show like with Shakespearean storytelling, you have to have some comic relief. And to me, in the four episodes of Star Trek Next Generation movies, this is the comic relief episode. So right. that's that. That's my meta take on it. Right. Um, beard. But let me ask you one more question about Riker. Well, because we were talking about the beard and the facial hair, right? Or, no, I, or, I mean, the beard and... No, right, okay. How good does Riker look in that chair when he's sitting there being captain? It makes you, like, you finish the movie and you're going, Where, where's my Titan series? What are we waiting for? I mean, the, the, he brings, you know, and to me it's a Kirk-esque type presence when he's in that chair. You know he's in command. Like, that was the other thing, the way he gives out his orders. You know, like... I'm doing, you know, like we're doing this. I got this under control. This is how it's going to be. Um, so I think Frakes, it, it, we go back to Sulu, should have had his own series after their last movie. Like they should have gave him a Titan series. I don't know why they didn't. I mean, I'm sure Zur has some kind of inside knowledge on that. Um, but like, why, why don't you take that step? It, it, he was just, he was so good. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll before I mention my other things, Riker in the chair, what do you guys think? Tremendous. We're, yeah. Love we're it. done running from these bastards or whatever. We're, I'm, we're through running from these bastards. Yeah. That, that was a, a great line yeah. and, and well-delivered and well-placed. So, yes. Just that presence. I also thought it was weird at the beginning of the movie that Jordy was on the bridge 
at one of the stations. Uh, I, I noticed that when I watched it tonight, that he's sitting at navigation or whatever he was sitting at the beginning of the movie. I, I always thought that was kind of, not, or not the, one of the times that they're, they're um, or maybe it was after they had that, like acted like ambassadors. Right. Um, one I more think, point. I think I remember that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, was, I thought that was kind of weird. And he's like, oh, I better get down to engineering. It's like, yeah, you're the chief engineer. Sounds like a good idea. Um, <laughs> last point. Like I saw something wrong with your chair. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw this movie with the Scott God. And so, Scott Cabay. And so I remember walking out. And he was pissed. Pissed. He's like, I can't believe we just went to see that movie. And I go, well, what's wrong with it? He goes, that was nothing like First Contact. And I think you had a group of fans that felt that way. First Contact was something so different, almost Wrath of Khan-ish different, that you go into this just like you go into Search for Spock, and you're like, what? This is what you're giving me after you just fought the Borg? This is what you're giving me after you just fought Khan? And, and I think you had a little bit of a division, which Urza, I remember talking about, Star, I remember telling you, like, I wasn't that big of a fan of Star Trek Three, but after I've watched it, this series, Ron, I appreciate it a lot more. Um, but, I, but I think that's why you see a little bit of a division with those movies. Definitely. I'm done well, yet. yeah, and I think, I think the box office to some degree reflects that in so much as that First Contact was one of those films like Voyage Home that found an audience and appreciative viewers beyond the core contingent Star Trek fans. And I think this one succeeded. You know, what, what drove the, the ticket takers to this one was to be a Star Trek fan first and foremost. That's not to say that you couldn't appreciate it. In fact, I think in many ways you could slap this on to a non-Star Trek fan and they would get everything you wanted them to get about this crew and about what, what this thing is. So what's this Star Trek thing about anyway? I think this film nicely sums that up for you. Like without boxing them into, oh, I got to watch nine of these things to understand who this is and what's going on. So I, I think it does its its job there very well. A uh, couple, couple of points there, uh, especially to something that Ursa uh, said earlier. At about the midway point of the picture, with the exception of the revelation that the Baku and the Sona are indeed one, one and the same, that, you know, we kind of stop feeding the audience interesting philosophical points or moral questions, and the second half of the picture basically becomes an extended action sequence you know, that plays out amongst the gorgeous Sierra Nevada mountains. I kept seeing these backgrounds thinking, you know, let's just stop for 10 minutes and go skiing because it looks terrific all these pine trees and rocks and it's like just let's hit the slopes we'll deal with the the sona you know after a good uh, ski chalet type um but it you know you have your your evacuation from your village and you have them trying to tag them with isolinear uh transporter tags and and so forth and and you've got rock slides and cave-ins and then we we transfer up up into orbit and we have dueling spaceships and holodecks and but but basically it becomes just sort of an extended action sequence over the last 45 minutes or so which is fine which is fine um but all of the initial setup of these philosophical things that they're sort of testing the waters with and, and teasing us with they they kind of s slide into the background and in, uh, in favor of the action and that's just the nature of the beast i get it uh it does feature uh Patrick Stewart getting his dander up. I always say I always go into these movies and want him to yell at somebody, and he and Anthony Zerby have a nice, uh, tense conversation there. You know, how many would it be? How many would it justify for you to do this? A thousand? Ten thousand? A million? How many, Admiral? You know, so that's always gives you shivers when he gets to bark at people there. Um, my favorite funny moment that Ursa, Ma Ursa Master mentioned uh Picard doing a mambo. I mean, it's a brief moment. It goes back to this blue balls theory of this untapped sexuality of the of the captain. Uh, but there he is. He's like, you know, put on some music. No, not that. Maybe a mambo. And then he's, you know, cutting a rug there for a few moments. And you're like, you go, Sean Luke, you go. <laughs> now the studio actually uh, they they nixed 
any on-screen kiss between Jean-Luc Picard and Anij. And, and there's a moment near the end of the picture where you feel like you can see where they cut it because it was, they're basically nose to nose and then we're, we're, off, we're off camera and doing something else. I don't know exactly why they nixed it. Uh, I know fans have always been supportive of the Crusher uh, Picard romance. I know yeah. Ruther's brought that up. But uh, this one went further than his relationship with Lily in first contact like there was genuine there was a genuine romantic spark you know kindled between these two souls and i mean it's kind of a shame in the sense that we couldn't see sort of a mature romance i mean if you will you know it's i mean we have yeah good point we have Riker and troy you know who who we've been rooting for to get together ever since you know season one i guess of the of the show but here's, you know, here's Picard taking a moment, finding somebody that could perhaps, you know, teach an old dog new tricks, you know, and, and she even teases him with saying, you know, I can't believe you're so young or, you know, you, you, you could learn that. From yeah. Young, like she does a little, a little thing there. She's a little frisky. Um, but, uh, but that relationship that, you know, I think Patrick Stewart mentioned in an interview, you know, I really wish they would have kept that. That was a nice moment we had. So. I also want to mention before I forget, and I don't, I don't have it with me. I don't want to show it for fear of like getting sued by uh, YouTube or copyright or something. But if you Google this movie's right. poster, if you Google the Star Trek yeah. Insurrection yeah. movie poster, I'm look- I think of the I'm looking at it. of any film that they released, and that goes through the the Kelvin timeline and the original series. This is the best looking poster of any of the Star Treks. I, just as a personal note, I hate posters that just Photoshop a couple of actors' faces on there and say, hey, come see this movie, Patrick Stewart's in it. And I think sub- subsequently, the poster for Nemesis, uh, the next podcast we'll be attempting, uh, is one of the worst posters I've ever seen if you're trying to sell me That's on a movie. But this is, stop it. This is a beautiful <laughs> image of Ruafo or the Sona, if you will, uh, and you've got the Enterprise E, and you've got this great aqua and orange, and it's just, it's just a great throwback poster where you you could have you could have a little ambiguity and a little bit of mystery and beauty involved. So, like I say, that's always been my favorite poster, uh, if you will, that shows up on the DVDs and the Blu-rays and all that. But it's really a good-looking piece of art. Uh, and anyone who's watching this should should check that out for sure. So, anyways, uh, so the the second half of the picture, like we say, uh, P- Picard convinces the crew, hey, let's uh, let's do something. Gene Roddenberry would have had a heart attack off. Let's let's mute. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's let's go yeah. against. Let's take off the the captain's uh, bars and dress in civilian clothes and let's save these people. You know, from from the Federation as much as as the Sona, and uh, and it's a great. I mean, again, if you're going to summarize this in in one sentence, it's a great pitch. The Enterprise mutinies to save Paradise, um, and we get lots of good examples for that. Uh, at during this long extended action sequence, that's where Data and the boy, Artem, Art, Artem, yeah. uh, they have their bonding moments because. You know, his dad, Daniel Hugh Kelly, uh, gets zapped early with the isolinear tag, so Data has to kind of look after him. And I will say this, I I agree with Lord Uther completely that Brett Spiner is, uh, you know, an underutilized treasure. Thank you. Uh, I mean, and should have had more non-Star Trek uh, avenues to be able to showcase that talent, per se, because he's, you know, these films... More so even than the series, as you say, where you're basically playing a Vulcan. I mean, here right. he gets he gets to go for broke in all four of them. And we talked about this yeah. in the studio. Picard and Data would get sort of the A plots, and then everybody else would get what little business they could. And and this film kind of upends that slightly. Because while Data is a central part of the film, and while his going rogue early is what sets everything in motion and then his relationship with the boy you know all of that is done for emotional underpinning 
it's kind of a schizophrenic arc for him, right? Because in the beginning, we're kind of, you know, he's he's gone berserk, and then and then here he's back to non emotional non emotional chip, learning to evolve and be human with with the boy, and so to have those two storylines kind of crunched in next to each other, it's kind of a disservice to him. He does a great job. I, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like he doesn't do a great job with what he's given. But this is where the structure of the script or the, the, the plotting of the character are kind of fails data. But on the same breath, some of these other character moments we've been talking about between Crusher and, and, and Troy and Jordy and Picard, which I have been very careful not to bring up because I'm sure it's going to come up at the end of this podcast, um, and Riker and Troy, like those moments stand out. Again, these, these, these funny bits, these emotional bits, they stand out just as much as the Picard data, you know, because, again, they get the main storylines, if you will. So I feel like in this one, they kind of they kind of gave data a little short shrift by giving him these two storylines and kind of crunching them, trying to tie them all together, and it doesn't quite balance out. But the rest of the crew, I think this is the most the most we get of them was so balanced yes exactly the, the balance was really there hey warp core podcast fans it's me urza master of the warp core podcast here to tell you about sanctuary woodworking uh, great great craftsmanship over there they make gaming tables which are really unique they double as a tv but also can display your interactive maps for all your tabletop gaming needs games like starfinder D and D and others. So if you need a gaming table, check out sanctuarywoodworking.com. And you can't complain if you're a fan of Riker, Troy, Jordy. Even, I mean, Crusher's wielding a, a rifle. Wharf, uh, you know, she's yeah. wielding a phaser rifle. There, she's taking these isolinear drones out. You know, it's like <laughs> yep. Doc. It's funny you say that because when I was watching today, I was like, man, for a doctor, she is a great shot. I mean, I first shot this. knocks it out of the air. Absolutely. So, and then, I mean, that brings us to, again, the climax and, and the special effects. It, it, I, I do want to mention those because I've been singing the praises of ILM uh, and their work. Uh, they yeah. did not work on Insurrection. This, as I said, was released in late 98 and ILM's first, second and third teams were all involved in a little movie that uh, Lord Uther mentioned earlier which was released six months later in May of 99, uh, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. So without being able to get anybody from... Double fail. Oh, sorry. Without being able to get anybody from the premier effects house in Hollywood, they had to go a different direction. Now, unlike The Final Frontier, which I think uh, we agree the effects clearly left something to be desired in certain instances... This was split between two houses, Santa Barbara Studios and Blue Sky. Oh. Now, Blue Sky, they started off in the visual effects business. They did Alien Resurrection. They did Mouse Hunt, which was a, a Nathan Lane picture that was somewhat adorable. Uh, and they did this one. But then they, they kind of branched off into animation. And their first film was Ice Age with Scrat. And they basically, they did all the Ice Age pictures. They did a couple of pictures, Rio with uh, Tropical Birds. Oh, yeah. Uh, they did Robots, I believe, uh, with Ewan McGregor and Mel Brooks uh, in 2005. So Blue Sky became more of a traditional animated company later in its thing. But this is kind of when they were getting their feet wet with visual effects. And I think they did a, a fine job. I mean, these were all computer generated. There were no model work. But I think the Enterprise E yeah. looks solid going through the briar patch, going into warp. You know, I think we get some good shots there. I think some of the planet effects with the isolinear drones and some of it, uh, maybe the two, the captain's yeah. yacht and the data shuttle might not hold up quite as well. Again, we're 30 years removed. I now. agree. But I, 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 compared to what I can thought was an unmitigated disaster of the final frontier. I think these, these hold up pretty well. Um, 
my biggest oh you know what we're going to save that to the end so i do have a i do have a thing where the effects work kind of let us down at the end but i'll, I'll save that for a little bit later ah uh, because that's going to be your got it yes exactly but you know overall i mean you know the picard turning the tables once more and and getting zapped out of there in the nick of time and and the the crew is saved and and I'm left with one of the, you know, the best moments emotionally at the end when, and, and it's done from a distance, right? It's not done close yep. up, which I think gives it more efficient. One of the Sonas, which I think it was uh, Ruafo's right-hand man, Greg Henry, is reunited with his mother, who is still approximately the same age when he got kicked out, you know, yeah. however many decades ago. So he's decrepit and plastic surgeon and stretched out of the skin and his mom basically looks like he was when he was a young you know punk trying to trying to you know explore the galaxy and so forth and they embrace right mother and a son embrace in forgiveness and it's not just a hug like, oh, like he's very reluctant to okay. give in to that moment but then he kind of like really leans in yeah. and you can probably tell that he's probably weeping into his mother's shoulder and so forth and uh, it hits me as an older viewer and I, I don't think it would have made much of an impression on me in my 20s but to see that i mean that's that is a great star trek moment it's a great human moment and i'm i'm grateful that you know that that moment is there that's something that jonathan frakes as director knows to to include to kind of to do that so i love that moment too that really stuck out for me um, and I think it's a tribute to Jonathan Frakes, as most of his contributions to Star Trek canon have been just phenomenal. Um, I also think he makes the very conscious choice in how he includes these humorous moments that I think define this movie. I think for all the heartstrings it pulls on and the uh, the battle for paradise uh, kind of angle which i think is kind of goofy and cheesy really it's not much of a battle it's more <laughs> of a chase and you know it's a mouse hunt if we want to use that <laughs> um but it's uh it, it's really interesting how he kind of almost downplays the action side of it to shine those human moments you know when picard saves uh anish and um you know the, the tub scene and and Frakes on the on in the captain's chair, like saving his ship from these attackers, and you know just these moments of grit or or, or, or heartfelt uh, emotion, just uh, they shine, and, and the way he puts this this camera to to scene is just incredible uh, to me. And the other thing is, I think I think honestly he he makes a very clever and conscious choice to I, I go back to the boob scene um where it's like he's he's showing you know the two gorgeous women in the cast from a distance i mean this could have been a much tighter shot emphasizing the assets of which they speak <laughs> but instead it's very muted and it's more focusing on data overhearing this and like a frisky horny teenage boy <laughs> he's like ooh boob talk and i know every time i perk up because at my heart i'm 12 and you know and then all of a sudden he wants to go use this line because it's something he's never heard before and they're even like uh data thank you right Crusher's <laughs> you know, like I, you know, move on <laughs> right it's just it's such a interesting like those those very oddball human moments because we all even in times of great tension or stress we have those weird little things that happen and that's I mean, this whole movie is just chock full of those moments, um, and you know it doesn't shy away from punching you in the dick. Um, you mentioned the moment with Jordy and Picard, which I think is totally unexpected, and yeah. really has no setup. You know, it's not like they're teasing out Jordy like slowly getting his vision back. It just sort of comes back, and it's like this tremendous moment for him, where he's like. You know, I've never seen the sunrise, and it's like holy shit! Like you, you don't, you don't really comprehend how. Uh, you kind of see how everybody's kind of getting sexy and getting, you know, their dance on, and you know, okay, this is this is cool. What's going on? 
But it's not just like the funny part. You know, it's not just the interesting lay in the pipe that this movie desperately needs a couple of sex scenes to make it. <laughs> um, but it's it's Jordy having this incredible moment of, you know, like Stevie Wonder getting glasses. You know, it's it's just this. I mean, I, I, I it almost brings you to tears if you think about it too much, because it's just like, holy shit. You know, can you imagine you know, you're, you're, you you realize what's going on here, right? And then they have they have to do their Star Trek thing. But this is a moment where it's like the blind can see. This is truly paradise. Again, back to that supernatural element. And I, it catches you off guard. It certainly caught me off guard. And I was like, wow. Younger man, younger Cody, probably doesn't even remember that moment. Older Cody's like, holy shit. Like with everything else I want to see happen didn't even dawn on me that like this is a very profound moment for Jordy and and I think if he had no other moment in the picture I mean that that moment alone is worth the price of admission you know at, as a, as a Jordy fan and, and and how he's able to do it and what I think is is interesting is that in that moment because I think later he actually says it explicitly, which which takes away from the effect. But in that moment, even as he is marveling at the beauty of the sunrise, you get the sense that he knows this is this is not a permanent change. Temporary. Like, right? That that he is accepting. He's trying to accept this gift, but knowing that he's going to have to give it back, or that he it will not stay with him. And and you can hear that in Levar Burton's delivery. Uh, and it's, it, I, I, like I say, we'll probably mention this in a few minutes, but it's, it's a, it's a really just beautiful, just you know, pull it out and, and frame it type of moment there between those two, and Picard just quietly standing beside him as the sun rises, uh, just very well, uh, very well set by director Frakes there. Yeah, Urza, are we gonna? Do our favorite, ep- our, our favorite He's scenes. And all that. I wasn't. I wasn't sure if you wanted to touch on anything there. Uzo. Oh, you looked like you wanted to say something. Well, so I was going to let you. Well, let you oh, I'm sorry. Up. Oh, yeah. The one, the one, the, just the one other thing um, that Zer was talking about in that in that final scene was when I liked how Riker reaches out for Troy's hand. I I thought that was that was a very telling moment. Uh, again, it wasn't zoomed in upon in a sense like it just it just it seemed like a natural happening so that thought of okay they're going to be together and, and and the other thing that for me at the end i'm like well where are they going to go from here i mean what's that next movie i mean we know what the next movie is awful but it's not that bad. um it, it's right up there with phantom mess uh, I know, I know, I need to stop that, but I, know, I can't. That's a pucker button in this moment screen right, there. right now. <laughs> um, but it, it just kind of left you wondering, you know, were they going to finish with the next one? Were they going to have maybe a couple more after that? Um, you know, but but again, just that the way the crew just kind of leaves in that scene as well. I, I it, just another testament to it as a as an episode that's a movie. Um, yeah, I, 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 again, I left with blue balls. Somebody needed to get laid in that movie and desperately needed to be Picard. I'm sorry, but Picard, like the whole series, I wanted Picard to get laid more than he did. (laughs) John, freaking Riker gets laid in every other episode by every other possible. Which is the Kirk angle. Right. Which is the Kirk angle, but it leaves you blue balled for Picard. Like, I'm sorry. But it's been 300 years since she's seen a bald man. Like, give her a dome ride. Come on. Um, s- anyway. I love so, how concerned you are about his libido. That's fantastic. I'm sorry, but if you were in your... Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> oh, sh- easy, easy, <laughs> easy. If, if, you were, if you were in space and you were yes. getting up there in the years... Yes, Gary. And you hadn't laid the pipe, you know, like the Mario Brothers in a while. You're gonna go full mushroom kingdom when you get the chance. You're in paradise. So uh, anyway, we're gonna try out um, this episode. We, we've we've come up with a couple new segments uh, to close us out here, and we're gonna go ahead and engage maximum warp. That is to say, 
what was your favorite part of this film? And Zer, go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I, I think we just touched upon it. I think that's why I was kind of dancing around it earlier. I think the Jordi Picard moment uh, is just for me one of the, the finer moments of this next gen arc that we've been doing, these, these three to four films that we've been talking about. I just loved it and it, it, it made my heart swell. Jerry Goldsmith's music, which uh, at times sounded like his score for Rudy and at other times sounded like his score for Rambo and First Blood, uh, which is kind of a weird uh, concoction I'm, to be sure. But uh, he brings it home with that, uh, that the emotional swelling and so forth of, of his strings and, and uh, orchestra. And so I just think wonderful moment, love it. That's the, that's the takeaway for me. Yeah, I'm going to go with what I, I mentioned earlier about um, Riker reaching out for Troy's hand and just kind of the way that they depart from the planet. Uh, again, that idea that we know Riker and Troy are going to be together, which is something we've been waiting for anyway, um, just seemed like a good way to kind of end that movie, and, and to me was a moment. Love it. Love it. Those are great, both great picks. Um I think my favorite part of this movie really isn't a single part. It's the setting of Paradise and the Sierra Nevadas there. It's absolutely stunningly gorgeous. And um, I think of it like being in a national park, but nobody sings you row, row, row your boat in a very <laughs> awkward, weird way. Um, and honestly, that's that's my favorite part. It's, it's picturesque. Every shot in this yeah, movie is great absolutely point. beautiful. And... While I could pick out a single scene that I, I really like, the whole time I'm watching this movie, I just notice how, how pretty it is, how, how gorgeous it is. And that, that to me, really it, it, it elevated a movie that was just an episode kind of thing. So, to piggyback on that, we've hit maximum warp. Now we're hitting our warp core failure moment. So what was, to flip the coin, your least favorite part of the movie, or maybe the worst part of the movie, you think? Sir? Well, and, and I want to be careful because I, I, I don't want it to seem like I'm, I'm going to somehow now retroactively trash the picture. But I thought that the, the final confrontations, sort of, we had the twofold. We had the Riker maneuver out in the Briar Patch, and then we had Picard and Ruafo uh, duking it out on the, on the solar carrier, which is straight out of Tron, for those of you that, that like a good Tron reference, uh, the uh, visual effects to me uh, mm -hmm. looked exactly like the solar sailor there. Um, I just felt like, you know, we get the requisite explosions, we get the requisite uh, torpedoes and phasers and all that, and that's fine. As a Star Trek fan, I want to see that. But watching it uh, recently to get ready for the podcast, I just felt like it came a little easy. Like, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that was in the scripting of it. I don't know if it was just how they were doing the effects. It just felt like, you know, that the 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 villains are dispatched in so, in so, sort of a cursory way, and there's not yeah. there's not sort of that, you know. Maybe I'm just used to you know bigger, badder, bolder, but I just felt like once they had once we had hit upon our, our solution, we're going to beam Picard out, and Riker's going to ignite. They're going to ignite the gas and. Like they, it, it just felt almost uh, not not it just a little pat, a little too easy, I think, to get out of danger. Like I wanted danger to be, like my God, are they going to do it? You know, it's Wrath of Khan. You know, you, how far are we away? You know, three thousand kilometers. We're not going to make it, are we? Yeah. Like, so that's that's the sense that it just felt like we're gonna we're gonna get out of it. I mean, overall, this picture to use, I know Ursa Masters, a James Bond fan, and, and we rewatched all the, the Bond films a couple of years ago during the pandemic. This is like Quantum of Solace to me. Like, it's a decent film. It's got some good things in it. Uh, and it for fans, it definitely pays off on some beats. But I don't think you'd put Quantum of Solace in your, in your top five. I, I might be speaking for myself there. It, you know, or it's the man with the golden gun. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a perfectly reasonable franchise entry, with the expectation that they'll go to bigger and better things. You know, the next time or two films down. Like, it's it's a perfectly 
entertaining Star Trek Saturday night movie, uh, but it shouldn't be the calling card, if you will. It's, you know, we, we, we as fans, we want to see it go rise to even greater heights. I have a tie. Every time F. Murray Abraham yells, now, I just, <laughs> it drives me. I mean, that man has a way better acting range than, now. I mean, easily, easily. Come on. But the, the thing that gets me scam? even, yeah, the, man, the manual joystick, it, just the way, the way, the way Burton delivered, first of all, this might be known as the Riker maneuver as he's pressing the buttons. And I'm like, can we just telegraph this anymore? I, that's not a Star Trek battle scene. And then the middle of the council comes up and, you know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. what do you, I'm going to get the Ram yeah. scoop and I'm going to, I mean, it's like, what? And the, again, too easy there, Zer. I agree with you. It, it was, that's not a good Star Trek battle, but stupid joystick. Okay. Well, <laughs> I also had a tie. Um, ah. Again, I I thought it was too easy. Um, I thought the joystick thing was so stupid. Thank you. Um, I, I did actually like the battle up until that point. I liked the finish of the battle, scooping up the gas and whatever. But there should have been some tit for tat. There should have been some, you know, Klingons versus, you know, Federation yeah. type space battle there. And then you scoop up the gas and, and blow them out of the water. Cool. Don't do it with a joystick. That's <laughs> so dumb. It was. Um, I mean, I still, like, I, I think I almost like it now because it is so stupid. Um, but uh, I go back to the blue balls. Yeah, I, I was, the yes. The whole movie, the whole movie is a one big freaking blue ball. Um, and you know it, what it, Nemesis is? E.D. <laughs> hey sorry go ahead my bad um no i but i mean you know from the from the start of this movie on you always want just a little more you want a little more battle you want a little more danger you want a little more toughness a little more grit you want a little more wharf you want somebody to get laid you want picard to finally have that random alien encounter that Kirk had all the time. Riker had all the time. Why can't Picard have one? What has he got? Vosh? I mean, come on. You know, it's just... I just... Ah, I just wanted him to get the pretty lady once. Um, or, you know, you want a little bit more of Data in the kid. And you want the kid to act a little bit better. I like him better than I like Jake Lloyd, but he's still a child actor, and all child actors suck. All of them. There's never been a good one, ever. The kid they all suck. sense. For Haley uh, Steinfeld in uh, True Grit, she was terrific. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I'll give, okay, you, okay. That. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I well, don't even start on Dakota Fanning and War of the Worlds because <laughs> I may have just ruined my own Friday or Thursday night, like, whatever <laughs> night it is. I just derailed my whole train of thought. Um, but you know, it, you just want. You want more. You get a lot. Don't get me wrong. This, like you said, Zer, is this is a very serviceable entry. It is a Moonraker. You know, Ooh, it's good, go. but it's not great. Right. It's you know, it's it's not a George Lazenby film. No. Nope. But it's and maybe it's even a little better than Timothy Dalton. But it's probably not Roger Moore or Sean Connery. It's probably Pierce Brosnan. Um, oh, there you go. Nice. So. That being said, I, I could go on and on forever. And I'm not going to because our fans will disconnect and be like, fuck this guy. He hates to go to fanning. Um, <laughs> let's go with Scotty's Miracle. What's one thing, Mr. Scott, that you would fix to completely change this movie? One detail that you would fix that would completely change how this movie comes off? Go ahead, sir. Well, I mean, to be to be fair, I think I I think I would have tried to stretch out the. Hey, Warp Core podcast fans, it's me, Urza Master of the Warp Core podcast. 
here to talk to you about digitalescapepod.com, our production company's website and host to Digital Escape Podcast and many others. Check it out for all your digital escape needs. We have lots of great stuff out there from blogs, links to contact us directly, advertising opportunities, and more. Our website, again, is digitalescapepod.com. What the filmmakers initially, you know, their, their first impulse, right? Their first thing, they wanted to do this Heart of Darkness. We see it there in the first 20 minutes. I think they did the best with what the studio and, and everybody else who, who ultimately made those decisions allowed them to do. But I, I just love the idea of of giving the film some real bite, I guess. I mean, some real edge. And I think the idea of a beloved character going off the reservation and potentially being a danger to himself and his crew members, you know, again, the beloved data, and, you know, before we know his motivations and, and his reasonings, I just think that that's the kind of thing that puts an audience on the edge of their seat. So if anything, you know, I never want to review the movie they didn't make, but clearly there were still parts of that stew left over enough to, to sort of whet your appetite to say, man, if they, if they had gone further, you know, if they had, if they had really realized the, the, the courage of their convictions, like we might be talking about a film that, you know, completely transcended the Star Trek fandom and, and, and took its place as, you know, a genuine like piece of art, like it's possible. Uh, so that's the one thing that I think I would, I would have changed, you know, Man, it's, it, you're making this sound like the Tarantino, like Tarantino wanted to take the reins for just one film. Right. I mean, how how crazy cool would that be, in a sense, for that to happen? And and, and I'll take something from the film and I'll kind of change it. But I agree with you, sir. I I, I would have gone that route. That would have been amazing. Um, I I would have liked to have seen the space battle be a little different. Um, ejecting the warp core again it, oh that sealed up the rip in time it, it just too it, too easy and then blowing up the gas too easy um it's so almost, i think that that might be something that change. the whole thing with the warp core and it, it just feels like they're kind of like hurry yeah. up and <laughs> right right i, I agree 100 percent. That, that that's a great way to put it or is it you're ready to have your minds blown Oh, Jesus. The well, one thing I would change. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Now, I'm not going to say Picard somebody ends up laying the, laying the pipe. Picard <laughs> Picard has his – Picard engages in, in a group, like, massive orgy with the whole <laughs> clan. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to blow your minds right here. Hear me out. Come with me on this journey. One word. Lore. Ooh. Data goes off the reservation, but it's not data. The Federation oh. brings data in, ah. but it's really lore. Wow. It's a blood feud between wow. two two very identical peoples. Wow. Who does the Enterprise come after to try and save data? But who is it really? It's lore. And lore's got data captive. But then the one good good folks, the uh, I, for, I already forgot their Baku. name, the core, the, the Baku. Baku. Baku, Baku. The, the Baku, Ku is a drink from Japan. It's delicious. Um, no, the, the Baku have they find Data and rescue him from the cloak ship, and then oh. he's like, "Oh, you know." And then they, the Enterprise gets there. They find Data, and they're like, "Data, what the hell have you do? Have you been doing? No, it's not me. I was captive. It's actually da 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 Lore, <laughs> and Lore is helping these estranged, identical relatives." of these people try and retake their planet and he has some ulterior motive to use this new radiation to build i don't know a super lore suit or something i just think all you have to do is inject lore into the story turn it into a you know blood feud type story yeah. that adds your edge you could definitely add some pipe laying in there because it gives you a little space because lore likes to play cat and mouse and you know you get that classic data lore you know back and forth yeah. i think i think that completely changes the movie and, and you wouldn't have to add a lot to flesh that out really i mean it just adds one little dynamic element and you know i think it, you could still have a similar resolution with lore too he 
you know, Darth Vader's off into space until he shows up in season three of Picard. So, um, <laughs> not to spoil anything, it's in the trailer. So, yeah. With that, um, Star Trek Nine. I mean, we are nearing the end of what I would call the traditional Star Trek movies. What do we feel like before we go into Star Trek Ten? What's what's the feeling in the room? I'm going to tie my feeling to the warp core, like how we give it so many warp cores. Um, so I'm I'm going to give this one. I'm going to go five point five out of seven warp cores. Um, it, it's well, I'm going to. I don't know if I want to spoil what I want to say next week, but I'll say it. I'll do it. I would have felt way better if the next movie would have brought in like you're like you you know like you kind of said lore or who is Tasha Yar's um the Romulan oh man it was Tasha Yar's daughter wasn't there oh, yeah uh god who you know you know who I'm talking I don't know why I'm drawing a blink on that come on Zer. yeah I can't remember I'm still struggling with Tasha um, Yar but that's okay <laughs> Uh, but Wasn't but I she think, killed by a big tar pit. <laughs> <laughs> I just think like if the they dinosaurs. would have, I would have liked to have seen something like that. Um, and maybe they would have done that if they would have known the next one was going to be the last movie. Uh, so I was feeling good. I was feeling like, hey, you know what? Either they'll go kind of first contact ish a little bit in the next one. I was hoping. Yeah, you know, I thought Frakes will direct again. Did he direct Nemesis? He did not. I don't think he did. And yeah, be a, I think it's a pretty evident. Yeah, um, and so, or or do you kind of go the insurrection route again? But I was feeling hopeful. I think it's a solid five warp cores. I think I expected the franchise to go four, five, six deep, just like the original cast had. I had no reason to believe that Paramount would take a pause. Again, not getting ahead of ourselves here, but I, I like right. I say, I felt like this was just the middle part of an even longer journey. So, like I say, expectations you know, neither too high nor too low. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I want. Let's let's push the envelope a little more with the next one, and then maybe the one after that. And so I I I didn't see that the the horizon was rapidly rushing towards us. Uh, and neither did they, but we'll get into that yeah. next, next time we, we gather. And uh, I'm going to come in at, at five warp cores as well. Um, I feel great trepidation because for the longest time, I wanted another Star Trek Next Generation movie. And I remember seeing Nemesis in the theaters and I will never forget the conversation I had with my Trek friends. And I only had three of them in high school. And we all had the same feeling. It was okay. Didn't feel like the last movie. It felt like there was so much more they could have, would have, should have done. Um, we'll talk about it more next time. Now, in all fairness, I have not watched Nemesis in a very long time. Me either. And if HBO Max doesn't let me back in, I'm going to be watching it on VHS. Oh, so you are um, dedicated. Yeah, even better, right? So, um, looking forward, you know where Star Trek goes from here. Um, there are many, many good things that come because of the success of these next gen movies, and of course, there's the Calvin franchise. Franchise. I wanted to say that that way. I don't know, because I needed some flair. Uh -huh. I guess. Uh huh. Uh, because I want the Jean Luc Picard back in. Uh -huh. Back in. But uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we blew a fuse there for a second. But I, I really think that the interesting thing that Star Trek does to people when they watch these movies is that they bring you into a universe and they make it more accessible than even a TV series. And that's that's really cool. So I'm excited, looking beyond episode 10, to jump over to one of the series. And I think we've all kind of agreed, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're going from Star Trek 10 and episode 11 we'll, we'll hop over to Picard. 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we should go that route, seeing as um, the show is going to be it's out. The, so yeah, it's the logical continuation of the next gen storyline. So, um, for those of you who are watching this episode, thinking "f Nemesis," I don't care what they have to say about it. Oh. Um, I like this episode eleven promises to be really good. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, with that, as always, I thank you for your time, Lord Uther and Zur, joining us with the Kodan Armada. Appreciate your time <laughs> as well. I am Urza Master. If you enjoyed this YouTube exclusive podcast episode, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit that like button, drop us a comment, let us know what you thought about nobody getting laid in this movie and or <laughs> any other thoughts. And of course, check us out at digitalescapepod.com. Oh, which is where all of the Digital Escape production content is housed in one convenient location. You can contact us if you'd like to advertise with us. We are looking to get connected to you. You will probably see some dropped-in ads here of my ugly mug saying stuff about people and places we've worked with. And we will definitely have better ads for you than the stuff I've put together so far. So don't judge me on that. I am only one man. But <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you all again. Thank you. And uh, take us out. Hey, Digital Escape podcast fans, Melt Off podcast fans, and Warp Core podcast fans. If you're a fan of our shows, please check out digitalescapepodcast.com. If you'd like to work with us for any of your advertising needs, Reach out to us via our website uh, or hit us up on any of our social medias, YouTube, Facebook, etc. We'd love to work with you to develop an ad for your product, service, or business, and we'd love to have you on our show to talk about it. Thanks again.